Okay, so uh, this is the breakout room for research assessment, and we can talk about the declaration of um, research assessment from the San Francisco San Francisco research San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment. Um, so I'm happy to be here to answer any questions that anybody has. Um, Sonia, was there something you were going to ask? So um, maybe I will just start to put a question that I think might be of interest to everyone that is uh, related to the narrative-based CVs. What kind of uh, research outputs uh, should uh, go in a research-based CV? That's a great question, actually. Um, you know, the narrative-based CV, they're kind of they're designed to capture other types of, of research, me research metrics that aren't usually um, in a normal CV. So you would be asked for outbooks. You, you can still include your um, um, your published research articles, but you could also put in items that wouldn't normally be captured in a CV, like uh, data sets or contributions to policy or outreach, um, any knowledge, knowledge exchange, uh, dissemination that you've done. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's really an opportunity to get to give a holistic view of, of anything that you, you have done. So if you have contributed to the, to the development of any other researchers, or if you have contributed to society as a whole, um, in terms of your research field, uh, that's the, the, the type, the nature of items that you might want to include in an art based CV. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's quite important. Um that um, there's an effort to capture things that don't, don't go actually into numbers like the age index. So for example, I would like to ask uh, why the, the actual um, reason why HRB is not asking reviewers to take age index into account in the uh, grant assessment. Well, I guess we've never really asked uh, researchers we've to, to take uh, reviewers to take researchers age index into account because it is a flawed metric. So hate index uh, kind of depends on the number of publications that somebody has and the impact factor that those publications are published in, but it doesn't it, it doesn't actually look at the original research that people are that people have done. So things like reviews or case studies um, can inflate somebody's research numbers, research publication numbers, and also the impact factor of uh, of a journal would make it more likely to be cited, say, just because of the journal that it's in. So we do find that H-index is not a good reflection, really, of people's actual research output. And when you're looking at clinicians, clinical researchers, it's even more important that um, that type of metric isn't uh, taken into account because academics are very much um, Oh, have, have, are very much more likely to have a high H index, whereas a clinician is much less likely, but that doesn't mean that the quality of the research that they're doing is any better. Um, so we look at a more holistic research assessment in terms of the actual research outputs and the actual original research that somebody has produced. Um, and not only that, and going back to your initial question, actually, we would all, in terms of what you would put in the narrative based CV, what feeds into that as well, it's not only the research outputs, it's the contribution to um, policies like research integrity, if you've um, done any work in research integrity, if you've done any work in, in research assessment, if you've done any work in anything that feeds into actual good research practice, then that's something that would go into a CV as well. Sorry for jumping back on that one. Thank you. Um, so on, on another note regarding um, gender and gender bias, how does HRB um, um, take on gender bias? What are so how do we address review? gender bias yes. in terms of reviews and applications and how to prevent uh, the gender bias? Um, we do take a number of ste steps in terms of gender bias. So we would look at um, in terms of outputs, we only look at the active research time that somebody has actually contributed to their field rather than their academic age, which would be their time post PhD. So that would take into account if anybody has taken leave or has left their field for a period of time, that that wouldn't be a negative impact on them. But actually in career development awards, we go a bit further. We even, we look at, uh, we only ask for five research outputs, which means that we're not actually looking at the outputs in terms of the active research time. We do look at active research time in terms of eligibility, but in terms of their actual outputs and how they're reviewed for career development, it's just those five outputs. So whether you're a well-established researcher or you are relatively new to the field, you're more early career, you are assessed on the most of the five most relevant research outputs in that field. 
So it doesn't matter about the number of research outputs, but the quality of those five research outputs that you put forward. And that goes a long way to addressing gender bias, because obviously women will have more likely to have taken leave for child caring responsibilities, that kind of thing. And um, we also do it in, uh, in review panels. So we look at uh, how review panels are set up. We make sure that they are gender balanced. Um, and when we are doing face-to-face -face panels, we would seat people, one man, one woman, one man, one woman, uh, just to help the flow of the conversation and to make sure that there's no kind of area of the room that is taking over that has a, a louder voice, say, and that everybody gets their say. So there are a number of things that we would, that we would, um, number of steps that we would take to, to address um, gender bias. Uh, and in particular, we do actually ask people in the application forms, and they may wonder, why do you ask for gender in the application forms. And I can say that we don't, that that's not something that goes to review. It's literally only something that the HRB uses in terms of how, of assessing how many um, people are funded based on how many people have applied. So we look at the gender balance of those who have applied versus the gender balance of those who have um, been funded. And that's uh, in terms of looking at our own processes and how our own documentation is written and does it, does it encourage equally men and women to apply or is there some bias applied there so that's our way of having a look at that and thankfully um, we do tend to see that there is usually quite a, a good a good correlation between um, the gender balance of the people who apply and the gender balance of the people who are funded. Great, great. So going back maybe to the narrative-based CV, how does the reviewers have taken the different format of uh, the CV? That's a difficult one because I think it's a it's a it's sort of a step change. It's going to be a step cultural change. So the reviewers are now being asked to assess the CVs with additional information. It's not just the standard list of metrics that you can say you can assess this one compared to that one compared to that one. There's this whole other bulk of information that they now need to assess, and the re the reviewers are in. In the surveys that we've done, the reviewers are mixed. Um, so some of them say it's great; it gives you know a much more holistic view of the um, of the applicant, and uh, it's really great that we have all of this extra information in, in relation to their research outputs. Some others are, are not so sure. Um, they think, "Oh, I'm not sure. I think I prefer the other CV." But yeah, it's okay. It's it's a bit more difficult, but I can see the benefit. And others, um, a minority, we would say, just ignore the additional information. They just want they just want the metrics. So it really is about um, kind of identifying the reviewers, um, making sure that they're guided uh, properly in terms of how they should review these narrative-based CVs, because if the applicants are going to the trouble of writing these and putting in extra information, and then they're not being reviewed appropriately, then that's that's a big problem. But we do find that um, for the vast majority of reviewers do seem to um, appreciate the additional information. Uh, some of them, there have been comments that it might be a bit subjective, and um, that's something that we, we would have to address, I guess. And, and on the perspective of the applicant, um, how applicants are seeing this new type of, of format, what they, what are the difficulties or are they um, welcoming this, this change? Yeah, the applicants, uh, some of them, some of them like it because they, because they, they can see that it actually gives them an opportunity to put in this additional information. Some of them don't like it. And what we've seen is that uh, there is actually a correlation between experience um, and um, our and career stage. So people who are more established with uh, perhaps more experience and um, much more, um, say, bang for their for their book in terms of their metrics, uh, they, they're not sure that they want to reduce that amount and um, that they're, uh, some say they don't have the time to, to do this type of CV. And you have to ask yourself, you know, if you don't have the time to do the CV, then how are you going to find the time to do the research? But um, the people who are early, more earlier career, they really like it because it gives an opportunity to highlight the stuff that they have been doing that perhaps um, is a bit more peripheral and it gives a more holistic view. Um, so it is a step change in terms of, of the academics and in terms of the applicants, uh, but it is worthwhile. And what I would say is it's not, it, okay, it takes more time to write a narrative-based CV, but it's, if you have one done and you have 
written it in such a way that you have included all of your outputs for all of the research that you've done. You won't necessarily need to put that in every single CV. It's like having a job CV, a long CV of all of the experience you have and you pick out the bits that you need. And once you have that prepared, it makes it very easy to then to then take out what you need in terms of, of yeah, any funding proposal that you have. Um, but I would say to the more experienced researchers to not, don't, don't be afraid of it because actually if you can, if you, it, it's a good thing that you're actually being assessed holistically. You may have all of this research under your belt and you have lots of publications. That's still a really good thing. You know, you're, you're being looked at by your original research in terms of Jora. Um, so uh, people should really embrace it. it is, it's going to be a step change, I think, in the future. And we do hope that people will um, get used to it. <laughs> okay. On that note, like uh, we have just a few more minutes to talk about this, but um, I, I would like to ask you in terms of, um, there are people that are uh, well, uh, very, uh, communicative, well, good com com communicators. Will these um, be um, introduce some bias? People could be have an unfair advantage on this format by being uh, easily, more easily sell at selling themselves. Yeah, it is, I guess, um, it is possible um, that, you know, and I, I alluded to a little bit before about subjectivity and the in information that's included in the narrative part of the CV can be subjective, but it is up to, you know, reviewers are very good at identifying showboating. So if there's somebody out there who's very confident and, you know, will sell themselves, then that's great. But they, you know, the, the reviewers will be quite aware as well that some of it might be showboating. And other people who are not as confident about selling themselves, they, they you know, it can happen, but they need to be aware that it, it is subjective and they need to start being more comfortable with, with, you know, putting what they've done out there. You know, it's not a bad thing. Um, uh, one of the, I guess the last thing I'll say, because I know we only have a few minutes, is that uh, some people have said sort of, uh, is it too much information for reviewers to, to really assess? And it can be, um, because when CVs get very long, there is a risk of losing the, you know, not seeing the wood for the trees, because there's so much information there. And that has been something that's actually come back to us in terms of, of um responses in terms of feedback so what i would say to applicants is make sure that when you're you don't need to use the full word count and if you are using the word count make sure that it's critical detail that you're putting in you're not putting in additional minor detail that could actually mask your proper your, your real research outputs and just be careful about how concise you are in what you put in um, because it really is an opportunity to just um to sell yourself as much as you can and put in that critical detail of the things that other that otherwise wouldn't necessarily have been um, available for the reviewers to see. So, thank you, Anna. <laughs> I think there's useful tips everywhere during this presentation, and it will be much helpful. Thanks thank so much, you. Sonia. <laughs>